So go ahead and open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. And we are going to meet a man named Zacchaeus. And if you grew up going to church, you already know about Zacchaeus because there was a song written about Zacchaeus that will forever be in the top 10 junior church songs of all time. Zacchaeus was a... I learned that as a child. I did not know what the word we meant. I thought maybe it meant he was from Scotland or something. But I figured out that it meant that he was short. And then I immediately had a connection with Zacchaeus. I don't know why, but I just did. And here's the good news. Jesus has a different way of sizing up a person than we do. And his way can have a huge impact. So look with me at Luke 19. The first four verses read this way. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He was short. But if you ask the people in town, when it came to measuring up, they would have said that he was not just vertically challenged. They would have said that Zacchaeus was short in integrity, that he was short in virtue. He was short in loyalty to his own people. He was short in character. And and remember, when we talked about Matthew, we learned that tax collectors were Jewish people that literally turned their back on their own people to work for the Romans, to, to unethically take monies from their own people to support the occupying army. So they're not just cheaters, they are traitors. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. So the other tax collectors worked for him. He didn't just benefit from a corrupt system. He ruled it. He reigned over it. That means that there are two things that Zacchaeus is not short of. He's not short of cash and he's not short of enemies because everybody hates this guy. And we'll see that in a moment. And then he hears Jesus is coming through town. And he desperately wants to see Jesus. Maybe it was just a a fleeting curiosity. But maybe something deeper is going on. Maybe deep down in his soul, he is tired of being the guy that everybody looks down on. He's heard rumors. In fact, some of the some of the tax collectors that he had known that he attended seminars with on how to cheat your neighbor. Well, they quit their jobs and now they are following this guy who is coming through town. So something is compelling him. In fact, it's so strong. He is literally willing to go out on a limb because he must see Jesus. And what happened next is really neat. Verses 5 and 6. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now notice a couple of things. First, like any good preacher, Jesus expects a good meal now and then. You are supposed to feed the preacher. You either have him over to your house or you give him Applebee's gift cards. That is right here in Scripture. (laughs) But even more interesting to me is that Jesus never needed name tags. He's just walking along. He looks up and he says, Zach, I'm free for lunch. Let's go to your house. 
And Zach is shocked because it's hard for us to imagine God paying us that much attention when we haven't paid attention to him. And Zach has been called a lot of names in public, most of them unprintable. But no one has ever called him by his real name until Jesus came along. So he's excited. It says he welcomed him gladly. But now we've got something else in short supply. And that's joy. Because the very next verse says, All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. By the way, have you ever noticed that whenever Jesus goes to a party, poopers show up? And usually it is the religious establishment. But but notice this time it says all the people. Everybody in town, even the sinners, couldn't believe that he would go to that sinner's house. And Jesus decides to size up the whole situation. Verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, not sir, not teacher. Look, Lord, here and now. I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. About 25, 30 years ago or so, the word lost became unpopular. So we created new words to describe people that are outside of Christ. Unchurched became a very popular term. The most popular word became the word seeker. The irony is is that lost people are not called seekers in the Bible. Because in the Bible, God is the seeker. Zacchaeus did not find Jesus. Jesus found Zacchaeus. And he said to all the critics, you have to understand, I came to pursue and redeem lost people. And when it comes to those that need to be found, everybody's name is on the list. You see, the point is that we all fall short and need Jesus. According to Jesus, we are all little we men and women. None of us measures up to the righteousness of God. Paul put it this way in Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, we struggle to believe that we fall short. We struggle to see our own shortness. We're like the guy that went to get a physical and the nurse asked, well, what do you think that you weigh? He said, well, probably 160 pounds. She put him on the scale. She said, no, you you weigh 196. She asked him, well, how tall do you think you are? He said, 5'11". She measured and said, no, you're 5'8". So she asked him, what do you think your blood pressure is? He said, how can I know that? I walked in here tall and skinny and now I'm short and fat. (laughs) Here's why we have trouble seeing our own shortness. Because wherever we go, we can find a Zach. There's a Zacchaeus in your school. There's a Zacchaeus at your job. There's a a Zach in your neighborhood. We will admit imperfections, but we'll say, at least I'm not like Zach. And Jesus comes along and he does not say that we all sin the same amount. I mean, some people do sin more than others. 
He's not even saying that all sin has the same temporary consequences. Some sin causes more collateral damage than others. Here's what he is saying. All have sinned. How many sins does it take to separate you from God? One. All have sinned. None of us measures up to the righteous standards of God. All of us are Zacchaeus. But here's the good news. We are all findable and redeemable. Because it is impossible for anyone to send themselves beyond the reach of the grace of God. And we don't clap in our church. But you did not clap. At what I just said. So I'm going to say this again so that you have the opportunity to hear it and respond to it in the appropriate way because I believe it is an important sentence. Listen, it is impossible for anyone to sin themselves beyond the reach of the grace of God. And that sentence is your hope, it's it's your joy because you are Zach. And that's the point. And the point has an impact. Look, Lord, he said. Here and now, Zacchaeus has changed. You see, the the impact is a new person. And it's hard to imagine a new future if you are still defined by your past. But Jesus comes along and says, no longer is your identity going to be built on somebody else's label. From now on, your identity is going to be built on the gospel. From now on, you are going to know who you are by looking up instead of looking around. For too long, you have looked around at others to tell you who you are. That stops here. That stops now. That's why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it's in Christ that we find out who we are. And then another great verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. I don't think a lot of us believe that. For a lot of us, all the gospel did was wash the old person. You're still an old person. You just don't smell as bad. And that is not what Paul said. He said that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. The new life is not just forgiveness. It is forgiveness. But it's also formation. That what God is doing in Christ is he is birthing the person That you were always supposed to be. The person that you can really become. That's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 6. When we were baptized. We were buried with Christ and shared his death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead by the wonderful power of the father. We also can live a new life. Not a washed up old life. A new life. This is not the power of Robert Schuller's positive thinking. This is the power of the Holy Spirit working in you to develop you into the character and the mind of Christ. So that you don't live short of what God has called you to be. And the sure evidence of this is that you will move from a taker... To a giver. You will no longer be re, remain labeled by who you were. But you will start releasing who you are. Look Lord he says. Here and now I give. 
You see, the impact is a new person with a new passion. See, the old Zach lived for what he could get, but the new Zach lives for who he can bless. And by the way, unconsciously, every day you make a decision. What will be the primary motivator of my life today? Will it be what I can get or will it be who I can bless? He stands up and says, Lord, I cheated some folks and I got to make it right. So I'm going to give back four times what I stole. Lord, I've turned my back on the poor. I I built up my own little empire. I cared only about my little kingdom. But that's the old Zach. He's dead. He's gone. I'm living for who I can bless now, Lord. See, the evidence of the new you is the taker becomes the giver. I read a story about this couple in Kentucky named the Likens. They went out during Christmas time to turn on their Christmas lights. And they see this big plastic wrapped thing at the end of their garage. So they they take off the plastic and it is a wicker rocking chair that looks vaguely familiar. They remember that it was the chair that was stolen from their porch almost 15 years earlier. And with it was a note. And the note said, many years ago, my husband stole this chair from the porch of this house. But since that time, my husband and I have divorced and I have found Jesus and I'm born again. So forgive the cowardly way I'm returning this chair, but I am trying to make things right. And they took that chair into their bedroom and it has become a treasured keepsake. Because the old life is gone and the new life has come. And can you not see Zacchaeus smiling? He's not angry. He's not saying, oh, I guess I got to give a tithe every Sunday now that I'm saved. He's excited to share. He's, he's a cheerful giver. And the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. Do you know why God loves a cheerful giver? Because cheerful givers love God. Cheerful givers have figured out that the holy God came and and lifted us up when we could never by any religious system measure up. And in grace, he brought you into his kingdom and he saved you. And and you're so overwhelmed by that that you just just have to express your love to God. And how, how does the Bible consistently tell us to love God? Simple. Go love some Zacchaeuses. It is worthless to tell me about your spiritual devotion if it is not touching the material decisions you make. Don't tell me how much Christ is in your heart if it hasn't touched your wallet. The transformed life moves from taker to giver. And when you are moved by how God overcame your vertical challenges, it will impact you horizontally. Today, Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. Jesus is saying that generosity is the means to salvation. Or he's not saying it's the means to salvation. He's saying it is the evidence of salvation. That's why I really enjoy the story I came across a few years ago of a machinist in Detroit. He worked for the Ford Motor Company, and he was invited to church by one of his friends, and he accepted the invitation. And while he was there, the gospel grabbed him, and and it changed him, and he surrendered his life to Christ. He was baptized that very Sunday at church, and the Holy Spirit immediately goes to work in his life. And he knows that through the years in his employment at the Ford Motor Company, he has taken a number of supplies and tools home. They do not belong in his home. So he makes the decision the following morning to return everything that he has ever stolen, knowing that this could cost him his job. 
So he goes to his foreman and he explains, I'm a Christian now. And it is wrong for me to have these. So I'm bringing them back and I am asking you to forgive me. Now the foreman has to decide, well, what am I going to do about this? So he asks his supervisor, who in turn asks his supervisor. And it goes all the way up to the top. And they decide, someone decides, well, we should ask Mr. Ford, who happened to be over in Europe, touring one of the plants over there. So they cable Mr. Ford, and they explain this whole situation to him, and they ask, what should we do? I love this. And Mr. Ford cabled back, and this is what he said. Dam up the Detroit River and baptize the entire city. Because salvation always has an impact. And, and just not on the individual, because I, I want you to listen close. Do you see that by renewing Zacchaeus, Jesus was also renewing a community? By, by turning his heart around, he was turning a community around. Because Jesus knows that saved people are not short-sighted. Saved people don't see themselves as entitled. They see themselves as entrusted. Now, most people live by this question. Why don't I have what I don't have yet? Saved people live by this question. Why do I have what I have? And saved people want to partner with God in this whole wonderful business of renewal. They, they don't see the gospel as just saving an individual so that person can just march into heaven. But they see the gospel as changing that individual so that he can march into the world and give a witness to heaven. Saved people are not short-sighted. They see this whole renewal thing as being bigger than just them. They, they see that Jesus is out on the mission to reverse the curse because God doesn't want a world with cancer and homelessness and abortion and little girls trafficked as sex slaves. That's not the world that God wants and it's not the world that God is going to get. And in the Gospels, Jesus Christ is renewing the world for God. And saved people are so sure of our future, we want to give a witness to it right now in the present. That's what saved people do. So when the communist regimes of East Europe began to collapse, there was a lot of turmoil. You, you might recall in Yugoslavia, there was a civil war especially in Sarajevo. The different ethnicities were, were killing each other. There was a man there, a, a cellist for the Sarajevo opera. His name was Vedran Smialovic. In his neighborhood, there was a bakery. Food was scarce. There was a long line of people just to get bread, and a bomb went off. So he rushed to the scene of the carnage to help recover 22 dead bodies. The very next day, Vedran put on his tuxedo and showed up at the crater of that former bakery. And he played his cello. He played for 22 straight days. One day for every person that lost their lives. It was his way of saying into the darkness, I'm going to fight with the only beautiful thing I have, my music. And with, with bombs going off and with snipers shooting people, he protested the only way he knew how. And people said, aren't you crazy to go out there when, when you could get shot? And, and he said, why isn't anybody asking, isn't it crazy that we're shooting each other? And I want to say to you 
in a world that is pervasively more and more dark. Is the gospel telling us to hide behind our walls and just protect ourselves and hope that Jesus comes back soon? Or is the gospel calling us to enter into the darkness and bring the music of light? To to protest, to stand up against the evil that we see all over this world. And to announce there is a renewing that is already beginning. You see, saved people size things up differently and it, and it makes an impact. So we feed the hungry. We rescue little girls. We defend the unborn. We honor marriage. And when we do, we lift people up like they're in a tree. So that they can see Jesus a little bit better. That's the impact of salvation. So I want to encourage you. Why don't you stand up with me. And I'm going to pray over you. And then we're going to sing a song of worship. And while we sing this invitation song after I pray. The men are going to come and they're going to serve offering. And collect it. And my hope is, is that as we take up our offering this morning now, that you will decide to partner with God in this renewal of all things. So let's pray. Father, I pray that we will fully realize and, and live out our salvation. You, you rescued us when we were so short of righteousness. We had nothing to offer. And you found us. And God, I pray that you would find that our hearts are changed. Our goals are different. Our reason for getting up every day is new. And would you please use what we give just now to send light and beautiful music into a very dark world. And may we give with joy like saved people are supposed to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.